I had this addiction present and that I couldn't step into a marriage with an absolute guarantee that I wasn't going to hurt the other person. So many singles feel there's something intrinsically wrong with them. Like I'm broken because I must be because everyone else is getting married. Everyone else is happy. I'm not. People will beat themselves up for years over something they did or thought about as a teenager. I know that trusting God, trusting a higher power, trusting the process is about just trusting that whatever happens is for your good. It's not necessarily what I want to happen in the way I want it to happen is going to happen, but to let go and surrender that it's good no matter what. Welcome to the In Search of More podcast. I am your host, Ellie Nash. Join me weekly on my quest for more, more from myself and more from this world. We'll see you on the other side. Hi, Jackie. Welcome to the In Search of More podcast. How are you? Hi, thanks for having me. Glad to have you. Uh, glad to have you with us. So, first of all, I want to say how we um, met. You reached out. I did. And I guess you uh, you came across the podcast, came across me on Instagram, and reached out. So, I want to um, give permission to others who are listening if they feel like it would be a good fit. Don't be shy to yes. reach out. <laughs> yes, amazing. I love like minded people and collaborating and making a difference together. Okay, so what made you feel like we were like minded, or we are like minded? Just, just values and your, I don't, I don't know you so well, but just, uh, you know, just from what I've heard, your reputation and your content uh, and just, you know, your passion for, for doing good, making a difference, shedding light on important issues and uh, helping people to grow. Awesome. Thank you. Know, you. So the inner, inner game. Seem, yes. The inner game. You seem to focus on a topic that we haven't addressed yet on this, um, uh, on this podcast, which is dating, preparing people for relationships. Yes. So is, this is not something you've um, you've always done, right? You came more from a psych psychology background, and today are a dating coach. Is that correct? correct? Yeah. So I was a psychologist in Australia, Sydney, Australia, and then uh, grew up completely non not connected to Judaism in any which way. Went to Israel, fell in love with with my Jewish roots, and uh, stayed there learning for a very long time, about eight years to ten years, and then came sponsored on a green card in Jewish outreach worked in Jewish outreach for 12 years and then went into being a dating coach as out of a result of my own painful journey with dating. Okay. So being that we love personal stories, can you share, uh, <laughs> can you share some of your journey? That's always, I knew that I knew that was coming. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I, as I said before, became more observant from the, over the age of 30 already. And in that, in that Jewish world, it's uh, that's already, you're already over the hill. You're already gone. You know, yeah, I got married at 33. I was like, uh, my parents already said Shiva for me. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so I was already like everyone's worst case, you know, not worst case scenario nightmare. And then I didn't get married for another 13 years from when I so showed you got married up married in your forties. Yeah. I got married in my forties. I'm sorry. I got married in my forties and, uh, and I really, I really thought it was all over. I was going to be a cat lady. I was going to die by my, by myself in my apartment. And the stench was going to be so bad after a few days, someone would find me eventually, but that's where I went in my head. And, uh, you know, out of that painful journey, I learned a lot about personal growth, the inner game and about how our inner reality really affects our outer reality. It's not just a nice little cute uh, quote from Instagram. It is a reality that was so powerful, which came out through my story. So the brief, you want the brief story? Yes. Of how I, I got married. Mm -hmm. So what happened was um, I work for still part-time for All Me, which is a global uh, Jewish outreach organization. It has 320 locations around the world. And I was in charge of leadership development, director of leadership development. That was my full-time job and loved it. And we were going to a big donors meeting. Uh, CEO of a big company who was Jewish, wanted to potentially do some philanthropy. And he was interested in leadership. That was my thing. So I went with the COO. And before I went in, the COO said, you know, Jackie, he's- What Israeli. does leadership mean in this context? Young leaders from all different YPs, young professionals and campus who want to make a difference in the world and to find them and to nurture them, empower them, help create initi initiatives for them to make a difference in the world. Okay. So when you talk about leadership, you mean finding- existing leaders and leveraging their influence to uh, to assist the organization or seeing the potential in someone and help nurture them to build them up to feel confident enough to make a difference or someone who has creative initiatives who need an outlet or need some support or guidance how to get their programs off the ground or initiatives 
Understood. Yeah. Okay. So, so you're going to this donor meeting. So going to this donor meeting, he says, I'm just warning you, uh, this, this guy is very direct and he could ask you some personal questions. And I said, I'm, I'm good with that. I love Israelis. No problem. And so uh, I, I can handle, I can handle it. He goes, you sure? They could be really personal. He did it to me. He likes this by feel who you are. And I said, which I found out that most philanthropists want to invest in the person, not the proposal. And so they try, he was trying to sense, you know, who, who, what are you made of? I said, yeah, I'm good. So we go in, he sits down. He says, uh, there was the chief of staff, the CEO, my COO and, and myself. And he said, whose project's this? And the COO said, Jackie. And he said, okay, what's the numbers? How many? What's the, what, what's the project? So I start telling him all the details. And I said, you know, the, the mindset is you've got to be the change you want to see in the world. Thanks, Gandhi. You know, you've got to walk the walk. You've got to, rather than talk the talk. And he's like, oh, what are you doing to walk the walk? And I was like, ah, this is one of those questions. And uh, I said, you know, I'm working on this and I'm working on trust and I'm working on, I was sharing with him what I was working on. And he looks at me and he says, no, why are you single? And I was like, <gasps> it was like a dagger to my heart. And I was like, oh, this is what my COO was talking about. And I said, I don't know. I don't know why I'm single. Like, I, what do you mean to say to that? You know, I, I don't know why I'm single. He said, no, no, why are you single? And I was like, I really don't know. I, 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 I couldn't tell you. And he says, you know what you need to do? This is the guy, I don't know this guy. And he says, you need to go home today and you need to tell Hashem, I accept. And he bangs the table. And I'm like, I accept what? He said that you need to tell Hashem that whatever you decide in my life, I accept. Even if it meant ever not getting married, like not that we're saying that that would happen or that, that should, that's what singles should feel, God forbid, but like even whatever you decide, God, I'll accept it. And I was like, he got right into the core of what I was wrestling with personally. There's no way he could have known that, but I was wrestling with that. I know that trusting God, trusting a higher power, trusting the process is about just trusting that whatever happens is for your good. It's not necessarily what I want to happen in the way I want it to happen is going to happen, but to let go and surrender that it's good no matter what, right? Gamzu Latova. That's, and I was like, I was wrestling with that. I felt betrayed by God. I was angry. I felt betrayed. I felt devastated. And I didn't, I couldn't get over it emotionally, even though intellectually I understood the right mindset. And I burst into tears unprofessionally in the middle of this meeting. And I said, I try, some days I do, some days I don't. And he says, nonsense. He said, that's like saying some days I believe in God, some days I don't believe in God. And the other two are looking down in their laps, like completely looking down, like ignoring, like it was very uncomfortable. Now it's turned into like this personal counseling therapy session with the CEO. And he said, you have to go home. He said, trust is a choice. Trust is a choice. Go home and choose to trust God and watch what happens. Because all God wants is our trust. He said, you can't do it to manipulate God, but just do it because you, you choose to trust. Anyway, I was a wreck. I had every liquid from every orifice at that point in the meeting. And at some point, there's no more discussion about the project. Nothing we had discussed came up. It was, it was completely inappropriate. It was so unlike me personally to do this. And at the end, you know, the other two, the whole time, their heads in their laps, looking down, you know, trying to give me a bit of space. <laughs> And at the end, he had to leave because he had two banks waiting for him for meetings. And he says, you know, I like her. She's real. I want to work with you guys and runs out. And then we just left there. And I look at the chief of staff. I'm like, I'm so sorry. And he's laughing, shaking his head. He said that that was the meeting. He said, that's the best meeting we had in two weeks. <laughs> and I, I said, okay. Anyway, we left. He gave us some stuff to do for the project at the end, but to his chief of staff. But I, I couldn't stop weeping for a few days. It was like something had been ripped off my heart. And there's a term, or lata lev, I found out, a circumcision of the heart, like I'd never heard of it before. And I felt raw in my heart, like something had been ripped off in a, in a good way. I was like weeping, but not from crying. And I went, I, I went to my rabbis that Shabbat, actually, in Philadelphia. And you mean I, weeping, I, but not from sadness? Not from sadness. It was like a shedding. Right. I'd never really experienced that in that way. I had, when I was becoming observant, I used to do that for about a year and it was like yearning for closeness, connection. But this was weird. It wasn't yearning. I, I don't know what it was. It was a shedding. And a purging of sorts. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what it was. And I asked myself, honestly, I did a meditation. I'm very into meditation, connecting inside. And I did a meditation on Shabbat at my rabbi's house in Philadelphia a couple of days later. And I asked myself, honestly, why can't I accept? Really? I know God loves me. I saw God in my life everywhere. Why can't I accept? Yeah, I know I want to get married. Of course. What's the issue in the relationship? 
And I said, a little voice came back from a very deep place that I hadn't been able to access before. And I said, because I am judging myself as a failure. If I don't get married, I'm going to feel like a failure. And then I'm blaming that on God because I'm, I'm judging myself. And I realized I was doing this to myself. The judgment was coming from me that I felt like such a loser, such a neba, such a failure. And then I'm getting angry at God for making me feel that way, but I'm doing it to myself. It was such a realization, even though it sounds so obvious when I say it, but deep down, it, it really wasn't. And I decided very deeply there and then, I'm not going to do that anymore to myself. That that is crazy. I am not going to do it. No matter what, I'm worthy, I'm good. I don't need marriage to define my worth. I don't need marriage to make me feel good, to make me feel okay. I want to be married, but not from that place of I need it to define me. If someone would have asked you the question, like point blank, not a, not addressed it in the way the CEO in your story did, but more asking you at that stage, did you attribute your self-worth to marriage, to being married? Would you have said yes or no to that question? Definitely no. I had a huge life, very successful, meaningful, fulfilling life, lots of friends, lots of great work opportunities. Absolutely not. And also I had a very deep relationship with God and my own self for years. So I wouldn't have thought that consciously, but on some level around marriage, I just felt like a loser. And I think that's partly the society gives you that message. And then I bought into it. And I just, I didn't realize like how much I bought into that message that you're this idea that if you don't get married, you're a failure. Exactly. Yeah. It's so strong. It's so pervasive everywhere because because it's a value and we value marriage. I'm not dissing marriage. I love marriage. I love being married. Thank God. But it, it, it it's not a definition of self. It's an expression of self. And I literally made a decision not to do that anymore. And I remember then standing in front of God in prayer saying, it was two things. It was acceptance of self and it was acceptance of God's will. And I said, God, this is not what I want. This is not what I want. I don't want to be single. It's going to break my heart if you keep me single. It will break my heart. It still makes me cry. It will break my heart. But if it's what you want and you decide it, I will do my best. I will do my best with what you give me, but it's not what I want. It will break my heart, but I will make the best of it. And I decided very deeply to, to come from that place of acceptance. And the next day, my husband was suggested to me. Really? The next huh. day, the next day, my husband was suggested. And that blew my mind about your inner game. Blew my mind. Blew my mind. The power so, of so our inner world to make a difference. That God gives us that power. So how do you explain that? What was the energy that you were exuding the day before? Meaning had your husband been suggested the day before that meeting with the CEO, what would have happened? Would you have responded differently? Would the meeting have gone differently? What was the... I don't know. I don't know. I can only look back and, and gain you know, clarity. I, I don't know what it would have been like had it gone differently. And obviously not everyone's life works that way, even when they shift. So God was trying to, I think, reveal something to me to show me the power of this work so I could help others. I think there was part of that because it's not a formula. It's not a magic bullet. But what I think shifted in me was I became a much bigger vessel to receive such an enormous bracha blessing. I became, when I went, when you go in, when anyone goes into acceptance, particularly when it's not your will and you make your will like Hashem's will, Perkei Avos, right? Hashem makes him his will like your will. It's literally that Perkei Avos, that ethics of our fathers. And I think what happens, what I felt inside is that you let go. And when you let go and surrender your own will, you become a much bigger version of yourself, a much bigger vessel to receive that's that's my take on it, but I don't know if that's if that's right. You know, right? I'm wondering if it's more of a um, a spiritual thing that was going on, or an actual physical, tangible thing that was happening. But maybe a good way to um, address that would be to give maybe some client stories of people who were struggling for a long time with getting married. Yep. Met you, you helped them with their inner game, and then they were able yeah. to find uh, um, their man. Yeah, I had a client whose father uh, left when she was young, about, you know, left divorced, but then wasn't in her life anywhere near as much. And obviously she developed a mistrust of men. And uh, she knew that she was scared of trusting men. What if she marries them and then they leave? What if she marries them and she finds out some deep, dark secret? A lot of women have this fear, by the way. 
And that's because a part of her was so deeply hurt when her dad left, understandably. And that little part of her was pushed aside internally. I call it internal gallus, pushed aside, ignored because it was too painful. And it was hijacking her experience of dating, right? Because the subconscious projects into your experiences, as I'm sure you've discussed many mm -hmm. times. And, uh, and it was now creating a self-fulfilling prophecy for her, right? That she wasn't able to develop deep bonds with men because she was so scared they were going to be not okay. And then of course, what happens? They're not okay. And they leave. And it was, it was, it was uh, creating the same pattern for her. She couldn't get married. And when I taught her how to find that little part of her that's wounded and have a dialogue with it from your higher self, from your adult self, from your spiritual neshama, whatever you want to how call How conscious it. of uh, this dynamic was she when she met you? Did she understand that this fear was holding her back from trusting other men? She knew she was mistrustful, but that was all she knew. She knew she, I don't trust. She could feel she didn't trust. She could feel she was scared. And we worked on it for two months in my course. I really practically try and teach people how to do it for themselves, which is really what I, I, I prefer to do rather than keep going back to therapists or coaches. Learn how to do it for yourself. You can. You can have a higher level of emotional intelligence. And she learned how to do it. And in the middle of the course, her husband walked into her life. Literally, as soon as she learned how to hold that part of herself, and, and not let it hijack and she could see it and she could actually access a higher version of herself her husband walked in happily married to this day and uh it was unbelievable uh, literally I, I have numerous stories like that in the middle of the course the guy walks in as they've shifted because obviously that was the last thing to shift now not everyone has that experience but a lot do right you know and and you could see it you could see it work like that when you i have another one um Another one just couldn't open up. She was like, she was invisible, middle child growing up, wasn't seen for who she was. Sorry for all the middle children out there, but maybe you relate. And, you know, she was very adaptable and flexible, which is great quality, especially in marriage. However, when it comes to feeling special and seen and, you know, the one, you know, it was, it was much harder for her. And of course, what would she do in dating? She was terrified of not being seen and being invisible. And so she would, she would, be quiet if there was any problem and she wouldn't say anything to the guy she was dating because she didn't want to rock the boat and be rejected and guess what he doesn't feel connected to her because she's quiet and just everything's fine and everything's great and he rejects her and she says see i'm invisible no one knows me no one meets no one gets to to connect with me so when she came to my course i said you have to speak up you have to speak you have to share what's going on for you we practiced we rehearsed and this guy talked too much and uh, she, she said, I don't know how to tell him, but I can't get a word in. I said, you have to tell him. I can't get a word in. <laughs> you have to tell him. It's hard for me. I'm quiet. It's hard for me to interject. She was so terrified and she did it. She went out on the next day and she did that. And now she just got married. I just got the wedding invite yesterday from, from her, from that guy. They got, they're getting married. Beautiful. Yeah. So, so what was it about, um, you had mentioned, you know, from, because of your experiences, you began to focus exclusively on on uh on dating shifting away from i didn't want to i was not my plan my, so firstly to be honest i made a deal with god and i'd said if you get me married i'll help singles so i did do a deal however okay. i thought it would be <laughs> i thought you can't you can't manipulate god but i did do a deal where i said you know i would love to help singles if i get married however i thought it would be part-time on the side outside my job and i did a partnership with saw you at sinai a website where i did a a, a, a class and uh, i called the class there's nothing wrong with you for single and 180 people showed up without much advertising like and I was like whoa women men both both and I shared how being single is by design you're not a mistake you're not being punished it's a design that Hashem has created for you this journey of being single to build you and it's on purpose you haven't been forgotten there's nothing wrong with you intrinsically so believe in yourself that you're worthy and lovable and now let's talk about what you need to improve it's not to say you shouldn't be growing but in your core is worthy and lovable. There's nothing, so many singles feel there's something intrinsically wrong with them. Like I'm broken because I must be because everyone else is getting married. Everyone else is happy. I'm not. I said that firstly, that's not true. Have you seen how many dysfunctional couples get married? So many more dysfunctional, toxic couples <laughs> get married than you. So it can't be that that's the proof that, you know, in order to get married, you have to be a certain level of healthiness. It's just not true, right? So then, okay, so that's not the issue. So what's the what's the issue? It's to develop your greatness. It's to develop your your wholeness, your shlemus. That's what it's for. So I did this thing, and I'm talking like this, and I I'm talking about the pain, and I get it. I talked about the cat lady, you know, that I, that I thought I would be, 
And I guess I was just being real about my journey as well, as well as the subconscious and how it plays out. And halfway through, everyone's turning off the cameras. I was like, oh no, they're bored. They're checking email. You know, sometimes you like to have a finger on the pulse of your, your audience. And Right, for sure. Yeah. And I'm like, uh-oh. Afterwards, about 30 to 40 of the 180 emailed me privately to say, I'm sorry, I turned off my camera. I was bawling. And they said, no one speaks to us this way. It's so refreshing. It's so different. It's you get it. I said, of course I get it. I said, I'm your worst nightmare. I said, I, I was single so much longer than you, you know, I get it. And they said, and so when I realized there was such a need, I decided to go into it more full time. So it wasn't you that chose it. It kind of chose you. Yeah, it really, and my whole life's been like that. The whole, my whole, I, in Israel, I never planned to teach Torah and travel around. And also I just went to to learn a little bit because I knew nothing at 30. Right. Awesome. How do you, uh, do, do you measure success with your clients in some sort of way? Meaning if, if someone comes to you, what, what could and should they expect? I get very, very finicky about this. And I have goals and KPIs, which sounds funny for this kind of thing, because usually you think soft skill, soft things are confidence and self-worth. Everyone wants self-trust. How do you measure that? I get, I get very pedantic about locking in your key performance indicators, your KPIs, which is a business term. But I say, I want you to walk out of here knowing that you nailed it and that you succeeded. And so there's basically five things that people need to get married, I found, essentially. And that is, cool. ready, ready? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm ready. Clarity, <laughs> clarity, clarity in what you're looking for. If you don't, It's amazing how many people don't know what they're looking for. They think they're going to find, they're going to know it when they see it. Uh-uh, you got you to think it through. It's got to be led with the head. Right? So you got clarity, number one. Number two is um Confidence, navigating the dating system. Walk away from any pushy shatchans. Any derogatory, demeaning, pushy shatchans. You don't need them. Hashem doesn't need them. You don't need them. You can walk away. You don't need to be demeaned because you're single. So navigate the dating system with confidence. You know, when do you continue with a guy? When do you end up with a guy? What does your profile say about you? Does it represent you accurately? Does it stand out? Like all sorts of practical things about the dating system. Number two. Number three, inner peace. If you don't have a certain level of tranquility, centeredness, groundedness, calmness. You can't show up on a date and be authentic. You can't even see who you're dealing with half the time. So you have to know how to calm yourself down. I call it dating from your higher self, soul mode, right? But learn how to get into that, to that state. That's very important. Number four, self-worth. If you don't feel deeply worthy of a great person, you won't attract one. You won't receive one. You won't be open to one. If you don't feel worthy of a good marriage, really, honestly, you can't fake it. Then it doesn't usually align. Uh, and the fifth one is self-trust. This is unbelievable. Every single woman in my in my course is one self-trust. They don't trust their decision-making. So how can you make the biggest decision of your whole life if you don't trust that you know how to make that decision and feel confident about it? And so they're the top five. And then you have ways of measuring them. And so then I'll say, so let's say I'm talking to you and I say, okay, so how do you know you don't have self-trust? Well, Every time I go to make a decision, I go and call three or four of my friends because I'm not sure if it's the right one. Okay, so then a KPI for you would be you'd stop calling all those friends. Very practical tech for use personally. That's what you do. So we know the opposite of that is one of your KPIs. What else do you do that, that shows you that you don't self-trust? Oh, well, I ruminate over and over and over in my head. I go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Okay, so you would stop doing that. Very specific things that you're doing that tell you that you don't have these things and let's create... Reverse engineer and do the opposite are very specific, practical in thought, feeling, and action. Three different areas. I get people to put three KPIs per goal, one thought, one feeling, one action that shows you in a very specific way that you've shifted. So if someone were to tell you that there are many people who were to ask you that there were many people who've gotten married without sorting out these five areas of life. That wasn't you... a sigh on. That's not their scion. The people that come to me have, have tried for a while to get married and uh and or or they got they got either they they let someone they gave their power away to a mentor or a guide who guided them and they trusted them more than themselves, maybe, and it was the right decision. But I, I think generally um you need certain levels of these five to get married easily. Can you get married with angst and torment? Yes, you could, you know, and anxiety for sure. A lot of right, people sure. are very anxious. Okay, but that's not the goal. Yeah, it's not the goal. Why well, put yourself through right? That. And presumably, if that's who you were dealing with, they would have they would already be married. Yeah, the ones that come to me are like, I've tried, I've tried a lot of things, and it's not happening. What's got you know? I say, okay, so now you have to do different effort, different ishtadlis. 
There's got to be spiritual ishtadlis, practical ishtadlis, and inner psychological, emotional ishtadlis, in my opinion. And I find that people do the practical very well. Spiritual somewhat, like spiritual is like betachon and tefillah, trust and prayer. And then right. the inner work, least. least this okay, so that's where, your, that's where your focus is. I do spiritual and psychological, and I touch on the practical if they need it. But it's like a third, not even a third of my course. Whereas most dating, that's why I don't know what to call myself, because most dating coaches will be very practical and a little bit on the psychological, emotional side. I delve in deep dive into the subconscious so that people can access the deeper drives and motivations. But I guess because my background is psychology, I feel comfortable doing that. Right. And also you're seeing success. Yeah. Approaching in that way. Yeah. And it was my journey. Yep. Right. That's true. The, uh, the personal journey is the best, um, I don't know, the best director. Yes. hundred percent. And so in some ways, do you see a difference between, uh, men and women in terms of the type of preparation that each need? I don't see men so much one-to-one -one like that in a deep way. Uh, but I do think that the tools that men need are different. I think that the inner work, the meditation, the mindfulness, the connecting to yourself internally is harder for most men. Uh, not all men, but for, for a lot of men. Doesn't mean they shouldn't do meditation or his bodhidus, but I also think men need mindset work of like what's a realistic perspective. I just had a guy who came to me completely paralyzed with anxiety and I kind of saw him. I, I agreed to see him paralyzed with anxiety. Am I making the right decision? Is there someone better out there for me? Right. So men are always about like better, someone better out there hard for them to narrow in and focus, right? It's very different to women. We have no problem with that at all. So the, I think the issues are different. They don't have the self-worth issues. It's like how many women, you know, could I, you know, could I have, so to speak? Like I've got to settle on one. Are you kidding me? So there's like that natural, young, immature drive. This guy was young and he was paralyzed by anxiety and how to separate out the anxiety from the woman, I think is important rather than it, the anxiety is telling me that this is wrong. I think that's a very important point. And sometimes it's about getting out of being self-absorbed. What can I get from this? What can it give me? Sense of entitlement. Uh, rather, what can I give? How, it's going to develop me to step into this as a man, as a giver, as a provider. You know, to take responsibility is going to is what's going to develop me. And is this the person I want to invest in to do that with? So it's like a mindset shift. Women women have no issue with it, with that. So I think the issues are very different. Interesting. Do you have a um? Like your list of five that you have for women, like a clean list of five. Do you have something similar for men? No. No. And because <laughs> I didn't live it, you know, right. I'm, not, I'm not a man, but I, I would be so curious to speak to a male dating coach and see what their five, like what they would say the five are, but I definitely right. you, going into, being you have me person. thinking as, as we're talking, what, because there were definitely things I needed to do to prepare myself uh, for marriage. And my case was different because I met my wife in 2013. Uh, prior to that, I wasn't comfortable um, even calling anyone a girlfriend or saying I'm dating someone. Like I was too afraid of that. I got to that stage, but I wasn't able to get married. And it was after meeting her that I focused on recovery from sex addiction. Mm. And then five years later is when we eventually got married. But I'm trying to think if there were any specific, there definitely were, but were there any specific mindset shifts or other things that I, I had to go, I had to get around in order to, to get there? I'm not sure. I think, I think fear of commitment is huge. I would put that, if I had to guess, I would say that's one of the five for men for sure. Fear of commitment. Yeah, there was that. There was also, this was after years of therapy and years of um, recovery where I didn't trust myself not to hurt her as well. Right. right. So like that was, I kept telling myself that if I'm sober for a certain period of time, then I'll propose. And I couldn't, I couldn't do it. It was like so much pressure to stay sober for that long. I, I couldn't do it. And then eventually I said, you know what? Like, we're going to be together. I'll just make the commitment and work it from there. And then it was only after I got engaged that I had the um, kind of fortitude to, to stay sober in a different way. Not that it was my reason for staying sober, but it was that heaviness that was sitting on me from before kind of disappeared. Maybe mm -hmm. similar to what you shared about acceptance where it was like, okay, I just had to accept where it's at. And then from acceptance, you were able to meet the right person. I kind of had to accept the fact mm. that I had this addiction present and that I couldn't step into a marriage with an absolute guarantee that I wasn't going to hurt the other person. Right. Like I couldn't, I couldn't know that with certainty. I can just, I can know other things. Like in the event I did 
here are the steps I would take. If something happened, I would be honest. Like that I can be sure about because at some point in time, I know I can come to my senses. Interestingly, today, I don't see it like that at all. Like I don't see it that way. I wouldn't say the same things, but at that point in time, it definitely was there. If you, if you took this out a little bit, right? So you focus on some individual stories, right? The micro. If you took it back out, a lot of people describe the, the current situation of, you know, many singles struggling to get married as a crisis. They'll, you often heard that word associated with it. So on, on a macro level, what do you feel like is, is going on and what are some things that you feel could help with uh, the crisis? If you, would you use I, that word to describe the... I'm allergic to that word. Okay. I'm, I'm allergic because from, from my position of working with singles, because I think it is only poison. And I have no idea what's going on on the macro level, honestly. I, I have no idea. I don't even bother myself with it. I look at the single in front of me and say, what do you need to do to be able to get married? And one of those things that you must do is that spiritual hishtadlis, which is that you have to trust that it's not a big deal for God to find you one guy. So what do you care about the shidduch crisis? You need one guy. So why are you worrying about the macro? What we're meant to worry about the macro of the whole world. We were all worried about the macro of all the, every little detail of COVID. No, if you did that, you went crazy, right? You have to leave it to God. You have to step into surrender at some point. And so I asked this to Rebison Kamenetsky. She should have an Elias Neshama, Rav Shmuel's wife. Um, I asked her this when I was single. I would go, I'm very close to her son, Rav Shalom. And I would go there often for a meal for Shabbat. And I would ask her, I would play out my Yetzirah. Literally every argument my Yetzirah would say, I would play out with her. And I would then wait for the Yetzirah Tov answer, you know, from her. <laughs> and she literally said, there is no such thing as the Shidduch crisis. She's like, grab my hand, you know. And she'd be like, it, it's just you and Hashem. Stop it. You know, like, it's just you and Hashem. And I just had to hear that like 50 times so to go into my right. heart. To just like stop worrying about that. It's all that worry. You can't do anything about it. It doesn't affect your personal life really. Unless you think so. I'm got, that's it's like saying God can't find me one guy. You know, I leave it up to God. Like what you know? Okay, right. are there people? No, in the I often, I often when talking to, to people about business, I make the same point because people say the economy was terrible. The economy is great. And I, how relevant is that to this specific business right here, right now? That's exactly the economy is relevant to companies like Amazon, right? It, it shrinks by three percent or goes up by three percent. Their business, because they're because they're taking up so much space, they're going to be affected by the three percent. But the little right. bit of business I need to to survive, right? The economy can, right. and and Hashem can send you anyone and anything at any time. And uh, you know, listen for big communal leaders who are worried about who really are in the macro, I don't envy them. Okay. They've got to, they've got to make some decisions or they have to look at what would help the, the club. But from that's not my job and that's not a singles job. What, what are you going to do? Well, what, what are you going to do if you worry about it? You know, all that means is you're not trusting a shim for you personally, because people are worried for themselves personally. They're not worried for the club usually. It's right. usually. So yeah, uh, keep it. It's definitely lane. a different kind lane. of worry. Yeah. Stay in your lane. Stay in your lane, focus on what you need to do and trust Hashem. And by the way, I mean, I teach this in my course because it's so powerful, but Tachon is the one thing that literally lifts you out of the natural realm into the supernatural where those rules don't apply. And it says specifically, whatever you give your power to, you are the mercy of. Whatever system you give your power to. For the good or the bad. Hashem says you, you will be at the mercy of that system. So let's say I, God forbid, get sick. If I give my all my power to doctors to define my prognosis in my heart, I'm going to be at the mercy of the medical system. But if I go to the doctors because that's what we have to do for our shtadlis, but really in my heart, I only give power to Hashem. It's only up to you to make me better. These doctors are just messengers for you. And I truly give my power to Hashem, then I'm in Hashem's hands directly. And it says that specifically, I think, duties of the heart. That, that, that we get a choice. Where do I want to put my power? So I don't want to put my power in statistics and trends and crises. I want to say I'm put my power in Hashem. Hashem, you can, can't find me one guy? Of course you can. And the more we rely on God in that heart way, the more abundance and bracha comes down, shefa, right? It's like uh, they compare us to nursing, a nursing suckling child. The more the, the, the child suckles, the more blessing comes down. If I stop suckling from Hashem, stop relying on Hashem, milk dries up. I don't get that direct supervision in the same way. 
I st Hashem still loves us always and is giving to us nonstop, but I don't get that direct divine supervision that, that could transcend natural trends and crises. My, my, my marriage was ridiculous. It was like something popped in the, in the air. And then all of a sudden, every, every tear, every prayer that I prayed came down as blessing. And it was felt like it was just crickets for years and years and years, darkness, darkness, crickets. And then boom, you know, it, 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 it made no sense. Does your husband have a similar story in terms of uh, yourself where, you know, you had to do some inner work and then one day to the next something happened? What was going on in his world? He is a tzaddik and he was in a very painful marriage and went through a journey with that and just was quiet. In fact, so quiet. He was a cure of rabbi for 20 years and most of my world was the same world in the same world, right? Most of my world didn't even know he was divorced already for five years or something, five, six years before we met. They didn't even know because he was just so quiet about it. Didn't say a negative word and about anything. And uh, I really feel, and he stayed completely loyal and, and, and solid with Hashem the whole time. I, I really feel that it was like that, that, the merit he accrued in himself and the struggle, you know, to stay, again, to stay connected amidst challenge and pain. That was his greatness. Fascinating. So during that time, he was technically available as well, meaning while you had to work through your, your he inner just stuff. He got divorced, I think, 2016, 2017. So and you got married? 20, we got married 20, no, 2016, he was divorced. In 2019, we got married. So gotcha. all those years, like the decade before that, that I was single and everyone's like, oh, Jackie's too strong. She's too this. She's too intimidating. She's too that. She's too, that. I got so much of that. He wasn't even available. Like, <laughs> you know, and, he, and not just that, when he met me and I'm strong-willed, obviously, he's like, go, oh, you're my little superstar. Go be as big as you want. So the very things I was getting all this feedback and, and criticism for to change in myself was to him. He loves it. I saw a post, I think you put on Instagram, you referred to yourself as an alpha female. <laughs> Just recently. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But you have to be able to choose to drop that. Right. And, and let your man be alpha. Right. I was disagreeing that... with Gary Vaynerchuk who said, you just got to be you. And I'm like, like he, he heard another caller called in and said, I'm an alpha female. And I keep getting rejected because everyone tells me I'm too intimidating. And he's like, they're just insecure. You be you, you do you, you know? And I said, very nice, Gary. But I really think that we need to be able to have choice, not change yourself, but have choice around how you relate. So be able to, to step into the empowered feminine as well, not just the alpha masculine. Right, understood. Understood. But at the same point in time, those parts of yourself didn't need to change before you met your... No, I needed to learn how to date in a feminine way. I did, you know, and I did that. Um, Can you explain what you mean by that? Uh, the feminine way for it is to create space for the man. Allow space. Allow him to lead. Allow him to give to you. Allow yourself to receive, which is vulnerable. So many alpha women don't like to receive. I'm good. I got, I got my own bank account. I got my own door. I don't need a man. If it comes, great. If not, whatever. Oh, but he opened the door for me. It was so nice. He brought me flowers. Oh, it's so sweet. But I'm good. I don't need any. And we flip like a back and forth, like a mashugana. Right. So you it's, can't have both. So maybe you can help me with this because it definitely seems to me, right? Like if you talk about the feminine and that, um, the, the need to receive, right? We refer to it as feminine. But oftentimes it seems to me that a woman, a woman has a harder time with that than a man does like a man can in some ways receive much easier than yes, because it's a woman's yet Sahara. It's not a man's yet. It's a man's yet Sahara is they don't want to pick up the responsibility and carry Nisuin. They don't want to carry the family. So it's very easy for them to sit back and receive because that's the yet Sahara, right? Like the, it, it, that's, that's good. That's the yet Sahara is the other way for a man, for a woman right. that they're strong and, and a, a capable. And for them, it's harder to sit and receive it's vulnerable and that's the, the eight of horror is not to receive and not to become totally dependent, like as one. We'll all keep separate bank accounts. We'll all keep separate everything. Not that I have a problem with that. I also have separate bank accounts, but I'm saying it's, it's, it, it, it's this resistance to, to wanting to be one. You know, to, so you're to, saying a, a man specifically because he's meant to take the leadership role, the role of responsibility, his dark side is going to pull him into some kind of sloth or laziness and just... A feminine. Let someone else take care of your Let problems. Let someone else take care of me, correct. And a woman, specifically because that would be the healthy 
way of doing things. Her dark side is saying, okay, let me try to control every aspect Correct. of my life and the people's life alpha. around me. Let me be alpha. Let me take the lead. Let me make all the decisions. Let me, you know, criticize and, you know, make all the improvements and control and suggest and nag. and. Right. Yeah. That definitely seems like um, a macro problem. <laughs> so that's a macro problem but it's also a micro problem because on the now to different degrees everyone's different there's always exceptions etc cetera, etc cetera. and women i just want to be clear women absolutely can access the masculine side in life and be very capable and should be and there's nothing wrong with that it's not like we have to sit at home and just wait for the man you know to, i have a full life and a full career it's in the relationship to men that women this ultimate masculine feminine flow to create oneness is is the ideal meaning meaning mashpia makabel right mashpia is i am initiating from myself like the sun and the moon is feminine i'm receiving from the sun and radiating it back and they go together like a circuit neither is better or worse so to speak right the rain is masculine the earth mother earth is feminine she sits there is she is she oppressed no she's mother earth but she has to wait for the rain and as she absorbs the rain she sprouts vegetation she creates with that rain with that impetus and so too man gives to woman. So the woman. masculine is what? In this context, mother rain. earth is the feminine. Rain. Rain itself. Rain comes down, initiates from the sky. Mother earth absorbs the rain and, and sprouts vegetation. And man gives to woman and woman receives in the womb and then creates a child. It's the fabric of the universe, that flow. It's an amazing idea. It's a deep idea. And if it, and so what, what happens when it's in the reverse? Because I notice in my own relationship, it doesn't seem to work as well. If my wife plans a night out and we do something, it doesn't quite seem to go as well as when I plan a night out. And really? Yes. Oh. Not, not, she usually plans because it's more towards to her liking and, you know, my dark side wants me to chill, I guess, and hers wants to control. But um, I just, I, I'm wondering, like, if it's the male-female dynamic, then why, why don't you think it'll work well in the reverse? Meaning it's happening anyway between two people where one is deciding and what is being decided for so within the relationship between two people it's happening anyway but it's just happening from the reverse side the male because that's what that's the so, direction of the flow so to go the other way would block the flow how why does that happen maybe because kava came out of man and so man she was part of him and that's it i don't know but it's I, definitely I, something you see it's not unique to right to, to my relationship that's correct yeah, something, it's a, con it's a constant dynamic. And not only that, unfortunately, I have some friends from way back at Sem who are strong like me and they married the sweet, sensitive guys who can't get their act together, can't get a job or can't hold a job down or can't provide. And they are super capable in doing everything. And there's a lack of respect and a lack of shalom bias and a lack, it's very, very hard. But they kind of wanted you know, to wear the pants at the beginning because that was their personality. And I, I don't know why, for some reason, I was very clear when I was dating, I don't want to wear the pants. Like, I don't want to be the boss. Even though I'm strong-willed, I don't want to be. I have to work at it, but it's, I don't want to be. I, I just didn't want to be. So it's, it's, giving, it's giving space for, for him to receive. I'm very interested in this. Um, giving space for uh, her to receive. For, for, for the woman to receive, in your case, for yourself to receive. Yeah. It's hard. <laughs> it's hard. Right. It's right. What's interesting to me is like that specific where it's, you're the first person I asked this question to is why it seems to be so easy for men. Like, it's just, That's I don't know, maybe this is a, um, oh, it's whatever. It wouldn't be an appropriate example for this setting, but there's, there are other ways to make the point where it's so easy for a man to relax and to receive something where for a woman, it's not as, it's, yeah. it's not the natural, um, flow of things. And I wondered, Right. It almost seems like you're fighting nature, but you're saying like the dark side is pulling someone towards that. Yeah. Yate Sahara. Yate Sahara. One of my rabbis told me that once. It was amazing. So the Yate Sahara of this generation for men is not to be able to, to, to carry the achrayas, the responsibility. They don't want to do it. And even my other Rav Roshalom said today, he's even seen the degradation in, in men of like, they get a little sniffle and they're out of sorts for days. They don't go to yeshiva. They don't do out of sorts, you know, like they're, they're, it's hard. They don't have a resilience. Whereas it used to be, okay, you get a sniffle, you go to, you go to work, you go to, to learn, whatever. Uh, they, it's this sensitivity that's pervasive now. And uh, women, the other way, getting stronger and stronger, more capable. It's like saying, why isn't it hard for a woman to not control? It's easy for women to step in and control. You know, it's like, very I mean, easy. 
very easy, but that's because it's, right. like it's the same as you saying, why, why is it so easy for us to sit back and chill? It's the same as women saying, well, why is it so easy for women to step in and control? Because that's the, yeah, the, not, I, don't, I wouldn't call it the dark side, but I guess it is on some level. It's not, it's not us stepping into our elevated self, right? It's not us step, step, stepping into our elevated self. So, so what, is the, what is the challenge? Meaning from the male's perspective, I understand it exactly. I want to sit back and chill. <laughs> right, I get it. I get it completely. What is, what is so hard for, the, for, for um, on the, the feminine side to do the same thing, for a female to do the same thing? It's vulnerable. You could get hurt. Surrender and receive. Re when you receive, you're open. Number one, you're open. And number two, you have to let it in. So it feels like it feels vulnerable. And you could get hurt. You could get hurt. And then you owe. Once you've received something from someone, you kind of feel indebted to them. It's also vulnerable. So maybe it's connected also to being like men are physically, the physically stronger species. So being in that position doesn't put themselves at risk in the same way that a woman putting yes. themselves women in that feel same vulnerable does. a lot walking down the street in a dark night you ask any woman they're always thinking how am i getting home and am i going to be safe always men don't think that at all we're always we're always aware of safety and sensitivity to that right we feel i've, I've noticed also with women sometimes there's like let's say a comfort a comfortability with um expressing expressing whether it's expressing affection or stuff like that but it can mask as um, a desire for intimacy, but it's actually not a desire for intimacy. What Do you know mask, what I mean? What can mask as a desire for intimacy? The outward expression of affection. I love you. I want you. I, like those, that expression can, it all, can often look like intimacy. Like I've seen that where it, it looks like, oh, this person is interested in a close connection, but it's always from an external expression of versus a um, receiving. So what's it masking? The same thing, a fear of intimacy, right? So for a man, a fear of intimacy may look like this being disinterested. Avoidance, yeah. Right, avoidance for a woman. It may look like expressions of affection or maybe expressions of neediness or I want you to come home or I want to spend time with you or I want to do those things. And it's actually masking the fear of intimacy in the same way. Right. Oh, that neediness comes from just anxiety and insecurity as opposed to desire for closeness. I need Correct. To be, it's usually a fear of abandonment or anxious attachment is that neediness and that like, where are you going? Right. Like, Maybe if I explain and... the point in a different way. So, you know, in, um, in kosher, there's this principle that, uh, right, we, we don't eat blood, right? So, but if you, the salting, after the uh, cow is slaughtered, after a cow is slaughtered, it goes through a salting process. Mm. So the meat is covered in salt and the blood comes out. When you see it through that process, the meat is actually sitting soaked in a pool of blood. While it's being drawn out, it's being soaked in a pool of blood. Mm. So the obvious question is like, okay, now it's not kosher. It's just been soaking in a pool of blood. Right. So the Jewish principle that's taught, the, the kosher the principle that's taught is that being that the meat is busy emitting things it's not absorbing anything uh -huh. like right now it's in it's in the uh yeah in, it's in, in the a status Shia. of Shia versus Macabell, exactly it's in the yeah. status of so what's happening is the salt is pulling the blood out so the meat is expelling something so even though it's surrounded by blood it's not absorbing because it's not in the absorbing mode i hear so, you yes right so i kind of feel like the same concept sometimes right with females that happen where there's a constant emitting of energy and therefore there's no absorption. Beautiful. Of I love it. You know, your Rav Desler quotes you, quotes this. Rav Desler says, where, where demand begins, love departs. When I demand, demand begins, I demand when you're going to be home, I, I might, even if it's like, I looks like closeness, but love leaves when that happens. Meaning you, you can't have both. It's like two different states, two different worlds. Right. Meaning what, what, I, what I think would happen is that as soon as that closeness actually came, the person would run for the hills. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's what they call the dance of intimacy. There's a, certain there's a certain distance that every couple feels comfortable with. And when one edge is closer, the other has to adjust that back away. And if the other one comes closer, the other will also back away in some way. And so you can go like this back and forth. 
but keeping the same distance. Oh, yeah, it's very that fascinating. Makes a lot of sense. It's fascinating. Yeah, and so and you develop that, you inherit that, or you see where you see your role models or whoever it is you've absorbed. What what level of intimacy is is safe? Right. What is the what's the right temperature? Yeah, exactly. Right. Right. Oftentimes we think we want it warmer or cooler. We want it kind of at 72 degrees. Exactly. Anything higher or lower is what, uh, <laughs> yeah. what gives us problems. Exactly. Understood. There's also the concept I like is uh, of the, the, the degraded version of a man is a hunter and the de degraded, sorry, the degraded version of a woman is prey. And so the degraded well, version of a man yeah. is a hunter, an animalistic it, hunter. And the degraded okay. version of a woman is prey. And all you need okay. to do to see that is go out to a club. Not that you should, no one go out to a club, but like, that's what you see there, you know, is this kind of, it's nearly, it feels animalistic, literally. And so we, it's, it's important to look in, in your own life, especially for women, how do I objectify myself? And this happens all the time in dating, you know, that I'm not pretty enough i'm not it's all based on the physical now that that matters it's not not it's not not important right but i think that it's important to make sure that if as you connect deeper to yourself your inner game right your inner world you'll then attract that as a mirror in your life of people who also see you for more deeply who you are and the more you objectify yourself and pick yourself to pieces you, i don't know if you know this but women do this women will stand in the mirror and look at different parts of their body and just annihilate themselves right you know, based on that and and pick themselves to pieces so you're also going to attract people who might treat you also more superficially right in that way in that way do you get involved with um before i go to that question do you find that uh, people who get married later right so are forced to do some of this work that yeah. their marriages are stronger last longer than uh, some who get kind of swept up in the 18 19 20 year old yeah, if they're conscious, aware, uh, they have the skills, they've built themselves, they have a more different quality of marriage, whereas the people who get married younger, I think, grow together, have the potential to grow together. And uh, when you haven't had what you've needed or wanted for so long, you can also develop a de depth of gratitude for not having had what you had, and now you have it, you know, so I felt that- Right, so not taking it for granted. Yeah, I think there's that- Right, aspect. but you're also speaking to a specific type of um, people where it's- you know, especially within the religious communities, there's a lot of people who just get swept up in the waves of whatever's going on, right? And yeah. somehow, it doesn't necessarily mean they've done the work or anything else. They just somehow get married and it's like they're on the conveyor belt system. They get married, they have kids, and everything seems to work. I'm not even putting, that, putting it down. I'm just saying that it somehow worked for them. That yeah. the system that was laid out, like, gets to about 75, 80% of people and they just are part of that and everything works. And then you have those that are not part of that. And they're forced to do a certain level of work in order to, in, in order for it to, um, in order for them to benefit from the system that's, that's there. For those people, do you find that doing that inner work also translates to strength once the relationship is, once, once the relationship begins and not just as preparation for the relationship? Oh, a hundred percent. Cause the more, you know, yourself the more you can express that and uh, be emotionally intelligent in the relationship, for sure, 100%. There's no question. However, the risk is that as you get married later, you can get also more set in your ways. It's harder to be flexible and adaptable. So you have to keep yourself flexible and adaptable. I once asked one of my rabbis, you know, what's the best prep for marriage? Thinking he's going to give you some, you know, deep secrets and whatever. And he says, practice letting go of what you want. I was like, what? He said, practice letting go of what you want. You want it, let it go. You want it, let it go. This flexibility, this adaptability of like, I, I want it, but the relationship's worth more than what I want. So I'm going to let it go. Meaning not, when I say what I want, I don't mean core values or important, very important things. 100%, think, yeah. Yeah. So, so preferences, practice, let preferences, let go, compromise, flexible. Nothing's more important than the unity of the two of you. And that's sacred and that comes first. And so you have to be, as you get older, you have to work on that flexibility. And if you do that and you work on yourself, then the quality of marriage you have is, is incomparable to a little cute little schnook at 19 getting married. And then the, as they grow together, they'll build that together. So I still believe it's good to get married young, but you have to have a certain level of development in yourself to get married in a solid way, you know, and not get swept up in who's doing what and 
and everyone has to get married by a certain age or you're going to be left on the shelf to dry. Like that's terrible. You know, within a five to six, seven year range, I think we should be a little bit more flexible in our judgment, you know, ages 19 to 27. Let's give everyone a break. Uh, when you get to 28, you got problems or something, 29, <laughs> 30, you know, you got, you got issues to work through, you know, but they can be right. It does seem to, I have a brother who's 24, 25, and he like already feels the pressure. Like you're still yeah. young, but. Still, oh. What you think at the end of your lifetime, it's going to marry one little bit that you got married at 24, 25, 26 or 27. You think real, like it's, 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 I mean, listen, I don't come from that world. So I respect systems that are in place because it's better than the secular world. But at the same time, I think we have to be uh, common sense grounded. I'll be darko, treat people according to who they are, you know, and I uh, hope I don't get in trouble for all this. <laughs> Do you have children? I don't, but my husband has two stepdaughters. I mean, two daughters. And, and yeah, two, right. Do you do you find um, what you've learned about dating influenced the way you're parenting? Um, the two daughters you you parent them, right? They're they're older now, but when I got married, they were thirteen and fifth. They were already teens, so different to little little. Right. Uh, but no, that, I mean, I just learned to not pretend to be a parent at that age. You're, you're, I'm here for you. If you need me, I'm a friend. I'm not going to, I'm not replacing a parent and, you know, uh, creating space, uh, being willing to, you know, tolerate different dynamics, you know, rather than have everything I want the way I want. It's like every time it, things are difficult, I think, do I want to go back to that single life before? And the answer is always no. You know, we just have to, it's perspective. Right. It's perspective. So the dating experience and waiting that, I think it's more the waiting that long developed a depth in me and a capacity for keeping things in perspective, I guess. Right. So maybe I'll ask a question differently because it's something I think about a lot. So a lot of the people who are coming to you are coming after a period of frustration. Yeah. But a lot of them in their mid to late twenties, early thirties would be the, the norm. Yeah. Right. Meaning after a period of frustration. I guess so. Yeah. From the, yeah. from the FFB world. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yes. But they themselves, they're feeling a certain sense of how come I'm not at this place for yet. Sure. Yes. Right. I want to be married. It's not happening for me. It's happening for everyone else. But everything you've talked about are things that every single person can benefit from self-awareness, um, et cetera, et cetera. Right. The things that you've the list of five, the clarity and everything else that you spoke about are things everyone can benefit from. So the question is, is there a way when talking to teenagers or adolescents or things like that, or people at younger ages preparing themselves for marriage, are there ways you found to communicate some of these ideas, despite the fact that they're not feeling some of that same um, frustration? Um, yes. And I spoke at the Ohel Sarala Shabbaton with 750 from women, young women from the ages of 18, 19 to up to 30 something, but we had everywhere, everyone in between. And I gave the same talk and everyone was deeply affected by it, which is the idea of knowing yourself. You got to know yourself. You have to know who you are. You have to know when patterns happen in your life, in friendships, in family, forget dating for a minute. They're mirror moments. They're moments that you're meant to see as a pattern in you to work on as your tikkun, right? This part of your fixing. And they're not bad. Stop judging yourself for them. Work with them. Wrestle with them. That's what makes you great. And so we, most people think, I just got to fix my problems and then I'll have a happy life and then I'll be good and then I'll be successful. But it's those pain points in your life that are the source of your greatness and of what's going to build you. And that's what Hashem God wants you to look at. That's what, that's a mirror for you. So notice your patterns. What are your patterns? What are your holes that you keep falling into over and over again? You know, okay, what so are your struggles? You know, the, the Rav Shalom said, the Gomorrah says there's two, two, two hints to your tikkun. There's two major hints. One is which taiva do you struggle with more than anything else? There's one taiva. We all have taivas. And what, there's one that we struggle with more than other taivas. That's so what's a desire your, that seems to get our most attention? Yes. Whether it's okay. fame, honor. Money. I've been very public Lust. about my own. Last. Uh, yeah. Mine is, so my name is Yocheved, right? My Hebrew name. And my parents gave me that totally, totally secular parents when I was born. Doesn't make any sense. I don't even know how they know that name. My father was a Holocaust survivor and I'm so Yocheved. It's crazy. Last form of prophecy in the world. It was true. 
and uh, Yud is Hashem, and Cheved is from Kavod, which is honor. So am I going to honor Hashem or am I going to honor myself? And from a very young age, I was in front of audiences, dancing, professional dancer, and then on TV, on the Today Show in Australia, young, rid ridiculous, 20s. I was on there as a psychologist, as the resident psychologist. And, uh, and uh, you know, I go into a room and people would be like, oh, you're Jackie, the Today Show psychologist. Yeah, I'm on the Today Show. Oh, you're on the Today Show. And I could feel, you know, the, the feeding of that attention and uh only then when i walked off the today show and went to israel to sit in seminary with girls at least 10 11 years younger than me and felt like an idiot which as i was trying to learn hebrew i'll uh, bet you know like did i did i have to i stripped it stripped me of all of that like who am i without today show without that kind of honor and i had no idea really deep down and it was the best thing that ever happened to me i had to build myself from the inside out and then got the opportunity to then go and work for the Jewish people and do Jewish outreach and really try and honor Hashem's name. So it's in often in your name and it's often in your struggle, right? What was your... So you're saying there were two things that um, this rabbi you were quoting will, will give a person a clue into what their personal kind of mission or work is in the world. You said one is their, their desire, their personal desire. The second? And the second is... Uh, what are your accidental mistakes? What mistakes do you keep messing up on inadvertently? Like you go, oh, I can't believe I did that again. How did I get? How did I get here? How so did some I? Pattern how am I showing up. the same person? How am I being in the same circumstance? How I've got the same type of boss again? Are you kidding me? How did this happen? Because that's your ticket. That's what you're meant to work on. Okay, so in terms of in, in terms of so patterns showing up that don't seem to make sense, and then your specific desires. So what did that mean for you personally? How did you connect that to your own? work are the patterns no the, meaning those two things so someone's wondering okay what is my mission what is my work that i need to do in the world so you'd reference your own desires i'm trying to think for myself like i've been very public about um my own taiva so to speak my own desire right now you're probably helping I, people in that very much so uh yeah a lot of the work i do is talking about uh, that 100 percent yeah. And I went into helping singles. So it's often, often your tikkun becomes part of your tough kid, your purpose, not always, right? You're the nice, nice nisayon, get through the nisayon and you become the flag and right. banner, the nice for the world. So often, uh, but it doesn't have to be about a public position necessarily. No, sure. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not clear on the question. I just, you were saying that there was a rabbi who gave two points. So I just wanted to make it practical, like what you took from that. That's all. What he I gave two points as a way to recognize his personal mission, but or someone re wanting to understand their personal mission. Uh, to, yeah, yeah. So, so look at your patterns. Look at which, which, what patterns do you keep finding yourself in? And rather than feel frustrated and judge yourself for them, uh, think, ah, this is something. How interesting! This is really something I need to work on. We have to be curious about ourselves rather than judgmental. So that's one of the key mindsets which is I teach in my course is stop judgment now right now stop judging yourself because judgment just keeps you stuck it's 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 poison judgment is poison and when i say judgment i just mean beating yourself up mm -hmm. you have to see what's there to work on it so do it with curiosity that's so interesting i did that what was what's driving me there what what's motivating me and and understand that it's coming from usually younger unresolved you know wounded places and that's okay because now you get to see it to heal it it's not all of you all these little parts of us are not all of us it's just a part of us so we need to be able to heal it. And one of the most beautiful ideas is that coming up, I know we're coming up to Passover, is that the night before Passover, we do Bidika Chametz. And it comes up like, why on earth are we looking for something that we're not even meant to have a crumb of by nighttime with a candle? It doesn't make any sense, right? If you want to get rid of something, you, you do it with bright lights. I think it's a Maharal says that uh, because that, that idea of checking your inner world should be done with a gentle gaze, a gentle candlelight. It should be done gently. Don't go in harshly beautiful. on yourself. Such a beautiful idea that that external avoda that we're meant to do for Pesach is really mirroring your internal attitude and orientation. G gently look inside, you know, but look under every little couch and corner. Right. Don't so now I understand what uh, you meant at the beginning of the conversation that you saw some of my work and felt there was a, um, a connection of values because it's Certainly, you know, I talk about sexual shame, which is often the hardest thing for people to accept about themselves, whether it's a desire or an action or repetitive behavior, whatever it is, people will beat themselves up for years over something they did or thought about as a teenager sometimes. Right. And oftentimes it's something that's continuing to this present day. And, you know, the question for me is always like, what is right about the behavior? 
Like what is, what is right about that? In what context does that make total sense? Like, was that the right thing to do? Not that it is actually the right thing to do, but in what context is it the right thing to do? And then when you understand that, then it's much easier to let go. And the need underneath it is healthy. Often the need is connection or force. Yeah, exactly. Right. And and then the curiosity, it's one of my, uh, um, one of my favorite teachers to talk about, Gabor Mate, has a, who wasn't even a therapist, but he's taught tons of therapists, therapists a, a, um, a modality called compassionate inquiry. Right? Can we just ask questions yes. with compassion? Right? For so what I, reason am I yes. going to that? For I'm what into, reason is what, this pattern showing up? Exactly. So what you can do, I just found him, by the way. I just found his podcast. I had never heard of him until three weeks ago. And... Oh. I love it because I trained in somatic psychotherapy. One of my trainings was body oriented psychotherapy. So that's why I now teach people how to tune into your body because your body reflects your subconscious, right? If you want to know what's going on in your subconscious, it's going to be reflected in your bodily sensations and reactions and feelings in your body. And most people ignore that. They just live in their head. And so once you know how to tune into your body and you ask compassionately with inquiry, right? With questions, what's going on there. And you know how to tune into your body versus your head you'll get amazing answers back that are from your deepest subconscious. So that's what I'm passionate about teaching people because you can just jump so many years of just talk therapy. I know I'm not bashing talk therapy. There's a place for it. It's amazing. It's important. You get insight, but it's limited. Most of my clients come and say, I know what my issues are. I can't change how I feel about it. And you can change how you feel about it through going through the feeling and the sensation in the body. And when you do that, it just starts to heal and resolve itself. If you allow a space internally for that to happen, it will resolve. It will heal, even including physical ailments. I have crazy stories about physical ailments. Maybe I had a client who was having fainting spells and they got every test under the sun. Nothing's there, but they're having faint. They're going unconscious regularly. And we did a deep internal visualization going through that and asking the the dizziness in the head, what are you here for? What are you serving me for? And she said, it's the only way you can set a boundary. You don't set boundaries. I have to get you out of there. Literally, her body was shutting herself down subconsciously to get her out of certain dynamics. And she could not believe she got that answer in her head. And she realized it was completely true. And when she fully owned that issue and then learned to set boundaries, particularly with family, guess what happened? Fainting stopped completely. She didn't have one spell for 10 months until COVID hit and she moved back in with her parents, had a fainting spell. I said, if you need any more evidence, hello. (laughs) You know, it's amazing. I love it. It's just, it makes, inspires me. There's a beautiful book by the same gentleman I just mentioned, Gabor Mate, called When the Body Says No. And he talks about um, yes. the stress disease connection, that the physical body is shutting down, oftentimes because of someone's inability to set boundaries to say no. And the body says, yes. okay, if you don't, I'll do it for you. Yes, beautiful. And also I find that with women and weight. If women can't set boundaries with themselves emotionally, they'll put on a lot of weight as the weight will be the buffer and the boundary. And as they work through their emotional issues uh, and be able to set boundaries, often the weight will start to drop off. Unless so they're what, really eating, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, not in a way they shouldn't. Can you explain that, that connection? Why would the weight provide a, a boundary? What is the... Personally, physically, they feel much bigger and, and more protected from the weight. Okay. And secondly, if it's around men, it's like also pushing men away of like, I'm not, I don't want to be attractive to men. Oh, interesting. Okay. Sub- subconsciously, not consciously. Right. You know? right. And no, yes, that's there what I are, thought you may be saying. I wanted to. Yeah, there are physical conditions, of course, and all of that stuff. But I found there's always, there's often, not always, there's often an emotional component that goes along with it. And I don't want Very anyone right. listening to, to hear any of this as any as kind of self-blame. Yes, it's so important. It's empowerment. Yeah, it's 100%. It's empowerment. It's it's include the emotional level rather than exclude it. The medical model today doesn't include it. And I think it's a mistake. So you have to do both. We have to go to doctors and we have to also do it through the deeper work. So do you have an opinion as a somatic therapist um, on psychedelics and uh, this renaissance that seems to be going on around uh, this world. I, I speak not. a lot about it. I'm curious if you have a. I do not like, look. I've got a lot of family that do it and and talk about it. I, I, you know, drugs and psychedelics. There's a reason they're in the world. They give they give a they show the potential of what we can reach. Right? They give us a, a glimpse into states and experiences that you could have. And they also I, I just don't know how sustainable long term that is. And I wonder, I don't know, I've never done it myself. It scares me too much to do it for myself. I'm one of those control freaks. But um, but I, I've, I know people who've done it who came out saying it was absolutely amazing. 
And I wonder if the feeling of that, because it's drug induced, stays with them and they can integrate the changes. And I haven't seen that so much. So I'm curious. I don't know. And I do not have an opinion as the answer because I don't have an opinion. I definitely don't have a judgment, but I don't have an opinion because I wonder if it's a great experience, but then what? Like, does it, how do you integrate that into your life? So you haven't, um, you haven't seen people, because uh, it's very easy for someone to have an experience and say it was amazing, it was life-changing. The question is, like, will someone see the change um, in front of them? So you haven't seen that? No, I haven't. I, I've, people have a very clear vision of certain things that they're scared of or certain things that they're, they have issues around and certain insights about themselves. How does that translate into change? I don't know. I think that 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 clarity fades because it was from a heightened experience. It fa- the the clarity of the feeling they had when they came off it fades. And the question is, unless you put something into action on a physical, tangible, concrete level, it will fade. That's the nature of those experience. Any experience, any high, any inspiration will fade. So I don't know. I'm op- I'd love to hear from other people. Right. They, we can discuss they- it offline, or we can discuss it here. I mean, I'm a. Uh... I'm I'm a proponent of it, not in the sense that I'm an evangelist for it, like everyone should do it, but I'm in a sense, I'm I'm definitely a fan for it being like a very reasonable and accepted approach to healing that should be considered just like any other. Like Mm -hmm. even the category of calling some of these things drugs, like I um I react to that a little bit because even that is a suggestion of some sort of programming that someone put on some of these things. Like, I'll give you an example. Like right? when we s- suggest a drug, a drug is often something. Let's say we call alcohol a drug. One of the hallmarks of a drug is that the more you take, the more you need to take for the same experience. Mm-hmm. Where psychedelics, it's the reverse. Mm. The more you take, the less you need. And then people will talk about, and that's both in frequency that people. Like they don't need to do the experiences often to feel the same way. Number one, but um, more maybe a, a better measure of that is actually in the in the dosages of it. So if you think about someone who drinks alcohol, maybe the first time they drink two ounces of alcohol, and they feel a, you know, a crazy buzz. Oh. But over time, people are drinking a half bottle of alcohol in order to get that same feeling that they felt from two ounces. If you take, let's say, psilocybin or ayahuasca or some of these medicines, these psychedelic medicines, people will describe the reverse. I once needed a five gram dose in order to feel the medicine. Now I can do it with a one gram dose or half gram dose. And people will talk about those kind of things. So you're hearing something that's very different than a a drug experience. In terms of whether it's sustainable or not, um, I have my own experience for it. I I used to feel like I needed to go to three, four meetings a week to stay sober from pornography and other sex addiction. And it wasn't only sober, it was more like those early onset of emotions that eventually would lead to triggers that eventually would lead to acting out. So I would notice that in a very short period of time. If I was not going attending meetings, let's say for two or three weeks, not I would notice it. That's irrelevant if I would notice it. My wife would notice it. Mm. Ellie, you haven't been to meetings in a few weeks, right? Maybe you should go. She would notice uh, an irritability, a shortness, uh, something start to set in. And um, I haven't been to a meeting in over a year. I don't feel that. She doesn't, she's never commenting on it. So I've seen that and I attribute that um, very closely to uh, to psychedelics. And I've had very little experience with drugs prior. It wasn't my experience Mm -hmm. at all. So I definitely think it's something that needs to be paid attention to. There's no question that there is a certain level of integration that's needed to, to ground the experiences and understand like what to do with it and how to actually benefit from it. But how did you do that? So for me, I had a lot of that before, right? right? I didn't come in. I don't know how I would have approached, you know, at the end of the day with any experiences, right? The experience are feelings or visual, and then we put language to those experiences. So what is our language that we have going into it? And many people don't have the language, right? right. You'd almost call it in, right? in Hasidic philosophy, you'd call it iris and kalim, right? You have lights, but no, a word is a, a There's no such thing as a tree. There's this thing, and then I'm going to capture it in a word. I'm going to call it a tree. 
but the word is not the thing. But the word right. allows me to right? The, the word tree is not, it's not it's, trees, it's, the label. it's two separate things. Yeah. But we have this word in order to describe this thing so you and I can understand it. So the same thing happens after these experiences that I find in my own, that I have a lot of language around healing. I've been in 12 steps for a bunch of years. I've been in therapy for years. I've done every kind of therapy I could find. So as, I'm, as these experiences are coming to me, I have a number of experiences and practices and things to lean on as a way to, to ground it. But that being said, I've seen people benefit profoundly, even without it, because there are certain people who saw things. I'll give you an example. Someone I know who is chasing and chasing and chasing after money. And as desperately as he wanted money, he kept losing it. He kept losing it to a very, like you mentioned, patterns to a very similar type of person. Someone who he deeply respected, who is 20 or 30 years older than him, right? And this was kind of the same pattern, an obsession with money and then losing it by overtrusting someone older than him. And then very quickly, first psychedelic experiences, recognizing that the relationship with his father and a loss he suffered there was still very much affecting his life and him chasing after something in those relationships was both his need to prove himself financially and the reason he kept losing it was because he was so desperate for a father figure that these people were doing. So regardless of anything that he does after this, he'll never unsee this. He will never be able to live as blind as he was living prior to that experience. And that's some of the quality of it is that there are certain experiences people have that they cannot unsee. And as a result, they'll benefit from regardless. But there is a huge um, need for the experiences to be integrated and for there to be language and community and everything else around it to be able to, to benefit the most from it. But I don't want to get into a whole conversation. I was more interested just so, so much of the way you talk about things are like one step removed from it. So I was just wondering about your, your thoughts related to it. Yeah, I, maybe I'll work up the courage one day to do it. <laughs> so if you want to have a conversation offline, we, um, sure. we could. But like I said, for me, I just, my, my interest here is not in, um, it's a major decision and a major undertaking, whether someone chooses to do it or not. My interest is only that it should be considered um, as available as anything else. If mm. someone is, is considering going on prescription medication right. because they're dealing with depression or anxiety, they should just as likely consider uh, psychedelics. Like These things should be available to us as one of the options. I'm not saying any of them should be done necessarily, but they should be considered like Option. everything else and a label of it like, oh, this is this drug experience. Like That's harsh. No, I know there's real meetings already in the firm world in Lakewood and different places. Uh, it's, there's a renaissance going on, a massive, yeah. massive, yeah, massive, yeah. massive renaissance going on. There's no question. Um, there's no question about it. Okay. Right. I hope everyone benefits. <laughs> no, it could. I've seen people benefit tremendously. I've also seen people get lost in the world. I'm not, uh, yeah. right. It is a world that's easy to get, uh, to get lost in. There's no question about that. So, and if, if someone is just meeting me here for the first time, there are other conversations on my podcast where I go into it in much more detail with experts in the, um, in, in, the, in the field who can, you know, we can pull it apart for the couple of hours needed to actually get into this yeah. conversation, which is not about this. This is more about dating, but while you were touching on certain things, I had to ask the question. Yes. Great. Do you coach men? I don't officially, I end up in conversations with people all the time. I run a business. I do this podcast, but okay. people ask me over the last few weeks, a couple of people asked me if I would coach. I, I agreed to do it more as a challenge to myself, but <laughs> Not for the... Uh, okay, let me know because I get a lot of inquiries. <laughs> My husband also coaches, but it's good to have oh, others. Awesome. He's, he's busy also full-time with his job. So what I do a lot of is I do a lot of, um, you know, triage. Mm-hmm. So from the podcast, like people reach out to me, question, I'll say, okay, I think this person can help you. And I end up You're meeting right. people, like these conversations, I end up patients and then, oh, I think you can benefit from this person or I think you can benefit right. from, from that person. So I don't, I don't do too much of... Um, like, you know, the ER doctor, which does triage and says, okay, this go to this unit, go to that unit. That's yes. kind of more of my role than sitting with any one um, individual for too long. I got my, the primary patient that I've been uh, assigned to is myself. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a big enough job. It's a big enough job. All right. Thank you so much, Jackie. I hope uh, people benefit from our conversation. Yes, uh, me too. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks. Have, have a great, great day. day.